thank you very much, all of you who joined, and in particular, uh, the MA field coordinators and MA AOR uh, members uh, for this webinar, which is on the International Mine Action Standard on victim <laughs> assistance. And I understand that in addition to those, um, I would say, linked to the MAOR, there are also other colleagues linked. Welcome to you all. The my understanding is the objective of this webinar is threefold. One is to raise awareness on this new, I would say, slash proposed, but adopted IMAS. Number two is to clarify uh, the role that the mine action sector can play in victim assistance. And number three, to, uh, I think, promote compliance. And in terms of context, of course, we are very pleased to have Elke Hotentet, uh, who was the force, my understanding, behind this new IMAS 13.10. She will be the main speaker to brief us, but she will also be accompanied uh, by others. Um, to make it less dry, if at all possible, when a UN bureaucrat speaks, um, I'm very glad to be opening this session because it brings me back when um, I believe uh, we were together, LK and I and many colleagues from UNMAS and all, <laughs> at the Maputo Review Conference. And I remember in particular being um, uh, on uh, small groups discussions, including one side event with LK uh, leading, as usual, on victim assistance. I can't remember the theme, but it was, I think, integrating mine uh, action in, in larger frameworks. And then, uh, we went on a few conversations, and I can say that she was instrumental of influencing us to get our acts together to do the United <coughs> Nations policy on victim assistance in mine action, which we updated in 2016, the one earlier uh, having been in, in 2003. So I'm so pleased now we are finishing the circle because the UN policy on victim assistance in mine action uh, refers to the IMAS to draw from. Now, the full circle, almost the full circle, we have a new product. And then I can bet you we, the UN, will be reactive and we will update the UN policy. So for the sake of clarity, I'm told, it's worth noting that it's HI uh, that led to the development of uh, this IMAS, not necessarily the MAOR in which we are right now, although we were all very supportive of the process. Uh, she needs no introduction, but she's the policy lead arm violence reduction at HI and also has served for about two years as co-coordinator of the Mine Action AOR. Uh, and thank you to the other speakers that will uh, uh, inter be intervening as well. I'm told I need to shut up now. Uh, I pass the floor to Christelle, who would facilitate, but I understand we are under some time pressure. Welcome again. Christelle, over to you, please. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. Very pleased to see a large crowd to joining us today. Uh, so the first, uh, my first discussion point I would like to mention is that 18 years ago, the GICHD was commissioned by UNMAS to identify how mine action could best contribute to ensuring that mine and UXO survivors receive all necessary assistance. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can, but we hear some background noise. Can whomever uh, close your microphone, please? This is Bruno. Uh, there's some extra noise. Please check your microphone. S'il vous plaît, vérifiez que vos microphones uh, soient éteints. Merci. So this study found that in many cases, mine action had played little operational role in direct service provision 
but had been able to advocate for the needs of mine victims, as well as to help to mobilize resources for the specialist healthcare organizations and bodies best positioned to provide assistance to people critically injured by explosive ordnance, survivors and other persons with disability. One of the key findings of this study was particularly relevant to our discussion today, and it was the following. In 2002, the study found there was a widespread lack of clarity about the operational role of mine action in providing assistance to victims of landmines and UXOs. Despite the Burn Manifesto, the Declaration of Kampala, and the joint WHO ICRC strategy on landmine victims assistance and guidance provided by a number of organizations on the provision of service, or as it was called then, the care and rehabilitation of victims, clear guidance on the role of the mine action sector in victim assistance had not been available. Nearly two decades later, IMAS 1310 on victim assistance provides this much needed clarity. That's my opening point. And now I would like just to go over the agenda. The first Elk and Rory will go over why uh, we decided to do a, an IMAS on VA. Then Elka will describe what is victim assistance, as well as the principles of victim assistance. Then she will go over the scope of the IMAS, some also uh, information about terminology, which is a critical issue. And uh, we will also have, uh, we will quickly zoom in the role of the mine action sector in victim assistance because people in attendance are mine action operators and coordinators. Uh, then we will have colleagues from FSD, HI, talk about the roles and responsibilities of mine action operators. And finally, uh, Gary and Elke will walk us through the role of responsibilities of the national mine action uh, authorities and also of survivor organization and of course also of donors. And if we have time, we will also talk about sex, age and disability disaggregated debt data as well as the human development model. Uh, if time allows. So we have a full agenda and I am giving the floor to Elke. Please, Elke, you have the floor. Thanks, Christelle. Hello, colleagues, friends. Lovely to see you all here. Over 50 of us, that's wonderful. Daniela, may I kindly ask you just to put up the PowerPoint presentation? I will briefly speak uh, really in a sort of back to basics uh, moment on what victim assistance is. I'll then hand the floor to Rory, my colleague from uh, the GICHD, before uh, I carry on. All of us here know that victim assistance is a legal obligation, and you can go to slide number three, Daniela, and that it is one of the five complementary groups of activities of mine action. The UN policy on victim assistance, just referred to by Bruno, recognizes the central place of victims in the response against mines and explosive remnants of war. Unlike humanitarian demining, victim assistance is also a part of broader, long established domains such as health, education, labor, disability, social protection, and even poverty reduction. It requires a long term commitment that should continue well after clearance work has been completed and as such really the ultimate responsibility to provide the necessary services to both direct and indirect victims rests with the state entities such as ministries of social affairs, health, education, labor. Now, while various standards exist on the different elements of victim assistance, including on emergency and ongoing medical care, rehab, prosthetics and orthotics, and here you can think about the international Society for Prosthetics and Orthotic Standards, guidance on the role of the mine action sector in victim assistance that a recognized international mine action standard provides has been lacking. This while state and non-state parties as well as mine action authorities, centers and operators have indicated that greater clarity around their respective role in victim assistance is required. So this IMAS aims to fill the need for clearer guidance on this particular pillar of mine action. 
It lays out the roles and responsibilities of the mine action sector on this pillar, and it is a guide on how key actors in the sector can contribute to victim assistance. Each has an important role to play in ensuring that needed services are accessed and available, and it's a role that the sector is really well placed to give, given its privileged access to casualty data and its related knowledge on the needs and geographical location of people injured by explosive ordinance, requiring immediate medical attention, as well as survivors and indirect victims in a need of continuum of services. IMS 1310 comes into force as soon as an actor receives mine action funding, even if this does not include funding for services in areas uh, such as health, rehab, prosthetic orthotics, mental health and psychosocial support, or those that facilitate inclusion in school, work or social life. So with that introduction, I, I would like to hand the floor over to my colleague Rory at the GICHD. He manages the secretariat of the, of the IMAS, uh, for the IMAS review board. So Rory, the floor is yours. He will just highlight the process for getting to where we are today. <coughs> Thanks, Elke. Thanks very much. Can, can you hear me? Can I just check that you hear me? Yep, just for those of you that don't know me, my name's Rory Logan. I work at the GICHD uh, and I serve as secretariat to the IMAS review board, which is chaired by UNMAS. And I, and I actually note that the chair of the review board, Alan McDonald, who I work for, is on the call as well. I've, I've just been asked to give a, a quick overview of, of <coughs> the process that led to where we are now, which is that we have a, a, a version of the document adopted by the review board. Now, obviously, as we've heard that <coughs> though IMAS has been in place for nearly 20 years, there hasn't until this year been a standard specifically looking at, at VA. Um, <coughs> in previously, the, the IMAS framework linked to the UN strategy and referenced to it. It was a, a reference to it was included on the website. But as of uh, February 2018, the review board considered a proposal by HI that came from Elke and her team. Um, to actually develop a standard that, that would govern that pillar <coughs> uh, operationally and for the mine action sector. Uh, the, the board um, chose to give that mandate. They, they, they reacted positively and, and um, asked that HI and, and a group of colleagues go ahead. Uh, the, the decision to, to push forward with the standard on victim assistance was uh, included in, this, in the IMAS work plan that was also approved by the IMAS steering group which is the group of uh, director level people in the UN and the director of the GICHD that, that sort of sits above and provides ex executive steering for the IMAS framework. Uh, they included it in the work plan in 2019 and a technical working group was established, which spent most of 2019 developing the document. Now that working group was, was quite ably led by Elke and co-chaired by Gary Toombs, who both of HI, who are also on the call, um, but it wasn't just composed of, of operators. It also had uh, members from <coughs> National Mine Action Authorities, um, uh, one donor organization, the ICRC, and, and other relevant stakeholders that, that came together um, over the course of that year and sort of to debate and develop several versions of the document uh, with the aim of trying to have the document approved just ahead of the fourth review conference, uh, which helped was in, in Oslo um, in November last year. Now we did just about get the final version of the document ready for Oslo, but I'm afraid, as, as Bruno pointed out, being a, a, a not a bureaucratic process, but the process had to be followed. So the actual vote that took place uh, to for the review board to approve this standard and have it published on the IMAS website um, didn't happen in time for Oslo and instead the board elected to defer that vote until their physical meeting in February this year. And so on the 10th of February this year, they they voted to approve the document as it is. And what that has done is that has triggered its publication uh, as a draft IMAS with, with review board approval on the IMAS website. Uh, and when I say draft, it, it still requires to go through the UN governance system. So it has to be considered by the IMAS steering group, but given that they put it on, agreed to it on the work plan, that might that's hopefully just a formality it then goes forward once they've considered it to the interagency coordination group for mine action and once the principals adopt it then the little thing on the website saying draft is taken off and it is and it is considered um <coughs> uh, an enforced standard as lk says um 
being mindful of time. I, I won't go through any more, and I, I'm, I have to apologise. I actually can't stay for the rest of this meeting, but uh, I hope that's exactly what you wanted, LK, and, and back over to you. That's perfect. Thanks much, Rory. Christelle, is that all right? I'll just carry on. Yeah, carry on. OK. Daniela, could you go to the next slide, please? Daniela, can you go to the next slide? Thank you very much. So I'm going to take you through a few pieces of, of, of knowledge that are really uh, fundamental in, in understanding how this IMS is constructed. Daniela, can you please go to slide number four, the one before? So what is victim assistance? I think it's important to unpack that first. So the international legal obligation on victim assistance recognizes that victims are entitled to receive a so-called range of age and gender sensitive services and an effective legal and policy framework. But let's unpack that. Consider victim assistance as a house, as it's drawn here, and I'm borrowing the image presented here by Cherie Bailey, who used to work with the Implementation Support Unit for the Antipersonal Mime and Convention a long time ago. So what we can see is that at the foundation of the house, we need data. What kind of data do we need? We need two types of data. We need sex, age, and disability aggregated data on casualties and time allowing. We will take a closer look at this later. Uh, important here to understand that we have been pretty good at collecting sex and age disaggregated data, but we do not know who amongst casualties actually were people who were already living with a disability prior to having an accident with an explosive ordinance. We also need data on available services to inform um, people of what is available, identify gaps in service delivery, and to support really importantly referral. Of course, data collection and management needs to be done with respect for relevant data protection regulations, and data should be shared with appropriate national entities while ensuring that data ethics and protection principles are respected. The mine action sector has since long collected casualty data for the purpose of informing who to target for explosive ordinance risk education or what land to prioritize for clearance. It has not, however, been used to facilitate improved access to and the provision of services for victims. And so with IMS 1310, the sector now also needs to analyze and share this data for this purpose. What does that mean? For example, it means reviewing the data to understand a range of things, including mortality versus survival rate of men, women, boys and girls, in order to inform actors providing emergency medical care in the event um, of an accident. Uh, sorry, in order to make sure that in the event that a, a higher than acceptable mortality rate is found, uh, in other words, anything over 12 to 14 percent, that medical actors can be aware of that and know that there's a lack of, a medic of medical emergency services. Another example of analyzing this casualty data for the purpose of victim assistance is to inform actors responsible for providing services, whether rehab, prosthetics, orthotics, or in education in the event that the number of children amongst casualties is high, as we have seen in recent years, to carry the data out of the mine action silo, which is normally where it gets trapped, by communicating it to the Ministry of Education on the need to provide inclusive education. Sharing identifying data about persons sometimes is not possible due to protection issues. In those instances, non-identifying data should be shared to enable authorities to plan the required services. As such, the data to which we as the mine action sector of access can contribute, if used for this purpose, to saving people's life right after an accident or to enabling a child who has been blinded by an accident with an explosive device to go back to school or an adult who has lost, for example, both lower limbs to access credit to set up a small business. So victim assistance, as you can see in this house, is built on this basis of understanding on this data and then it's comprised of five other elements. There's four service areas, so we have emergency and ongoing medical care, it's known like that in the mine action sector, but outside of the sector, that is actually called health. Another element of the house is rehab and psychosocial support, also covered under the sectors of health. And then there's socioeconomic inclusion, a bit of an odd term outside of the mine action sector, and instead is understood as inclusive education, inclusive livelihoods, and social inclusion. 
It is plain as day that related services are all part of broader sectors. And while the sector has a role to play in facilitating access to these services, it is also clear that it is not within the mine action sector's remit to deliver these services, nor that it is necessary to develop a parallel set of services as was something thought in times past. I'd like to take a moment to just look at casualty data, uh, data collection efforts by the sector, as I believe it risks being less clear that this too should be part of broader national data collection work, whether on injury surveillance, social protection, information management systems. Unfortunately, though, this data tends to get stuck in an IMSMA, an information management system for mine action database, without it being communicated to relevant authorities and service providers. This is a huge missed opportunity that, in addition, carries the risk that this data is lost when a country reaches its Article 5 obligations. And with that, sees the closure of its mine action center. Think of the case of Uganda, where with the closure of the Ugandan mine action center, all casualty data disappeared. It was not shared with relevant authorities and as such was not actionable to them after closure of the mine action center. This is not a sustainable approach to data management and underscores the fact that casualty data has so far not been collected for the purpose of victim assistance. The roof of the house that you see here is made up of national laws and policies. These should be developed and implemented to ensure budgets, strategies and programs are in place to deliver this range, this continuum of health, education, labor, social protection and other services in response to a solid understanding of needs in terms of who, where and what. The roof of the house also includes the development of legal and policy frameworks to guarantee the rights of victims with a few to ensuring opportunities in society on an equal basis with others. It's important to know that these policies and legal frameworks need not to be developed for victims alone and instead should cover people critically injured by an explosive device alongside other people with life threatening traumatic injuries. It should treat survivors alongside other persons with disabilities and it should treat indirect victims alongside other vulnerable persons. In certain instances, the Mine Ban Treaty and CCM obligations on victim assistance have led to the development of a national action plan on victim assistance in those countries where response to injury, disability inclusion or social protection were not prioritized. That was the case in Chad, in Algeria and in Tajikistan, for example. In these countries, victim assistance created a national dynamic that led to policy and program development that led to the provision of services and the enactment of rights of victims and a range of people with similar needs as them. While identification and referral are not mentioned in this house of victim assistance, related services are vital if victims are to access available services. Victims tend to live in rural and remote areas, far from capitals where most services are provided. Many barriers exist, including time and cost to reach services that tend to be based in those urban areas, absence of childcare and accommodation, lack of information or physical access and discriminatory attitudes. Identifying victims where they live and supporting them to access services is a vital step in ensuring increased participation and improved quality of life. Can I ask you to go to the next slide, Daniela? I will cover, I believe, three more slides um, with less content than the one I've just unpacked. So just bear with me. Um, the interactive part of this webinar will start shortly. So there are many principles on victim assistance. You see eight here, uh, which are in addition to the core humanitarian principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality and independence. I will definitely not unpack all eight. Instead, we'll focus on two, non-discrimination and accessibility. Now, if we have time afterwards, I might also unpack the rights based approach. Whilst the important principle of non-discrimination was not fully embraced by the sector in its earlier years, I believe we now have nearly an all encompassing understanding that we cannot favor one group of persons over another. This means that we now appreciate that access to services should not depend on the cause of the injury or impairment, but only on need. The Convention on Cluster Munitions makes this clear for once and for all. Said differently, if an operator conducting non-technical survey meets a person in need of service, for example, a prosthetic leg because of a mismanaged diabetes, this person is just as eligible to receive information on available services as a survivor. 
And you'll see that provision of information about available services is a core component that should be now fall under the responsibility of the mine action sector as per this IMAS. The principle of accessibility is equally key in that this entire IMAS is written to increase people's access to services, to eliminate some of the most fundamental barrier to accessing services. And this is a lack of knowledge about available services. There's also a huge lack of knowledge on the part of service providers about the needs and geographical location of survivors and other people in need. Now, this document, we believe, um, as you will see as we go in it with my colleagues, is a much needed document. It has been welcomed by the sector, um, but it will also, as you will shortly see, open up areas for debate. Let's make it clear that we at HI do not have all the answers and that we look forward to exchanging with you on that. Can you go to the next slide, Daniela? So let's take a brief look at the scope of IMAS 1310, which is slide six, Daniela. IMAS 1310 recognizes upfront that the ultimate responsibility for victim assistance lies with affected states. It describes that particular roles and responsibilities of the mine action sector in supporting victim assistance. Specifically, it articulates the roles and responsibilities of national mine action authorities and national mine action centers who are working in support of relevant government entities charged with coordinating and providing services and with developing and implementing policies to meet the needs and address the rights of explosive ordnance victims amongst their broader population. This IMAS also identifies the role of mine action operators and donors, as well as the UN and survivor organizations. Rory well explained the development process for this IMAS. In addition, there was another step, which was that HI met with approximately 30 people in September of 2019 to define the actual roles and responsibilities of affected states. We met with representatives from 17 countries. In addition to representatives of these countries, the ICBL was there, as well as the Implementation Support Unit to the Mine Ban Treaty and UNMAS. Let's move to the next slide, seven on terminology. I will really only speak to a view of the terms being used. As all of you are really familiar with the IMAS series, three terms are used to indicate a degree of responsibility or intended degree of compliance to conduct certain actions. These are the terms shall, should, and may. In layman's language, shall translates as a must, should as pervert, and may as optional. Now, while in the earlier days of the Maimon Treaty, there was still a lack of consensus as to the meaning of the term victim, this is fortunately no longer the case. I trust you're all familiar with the terms victims, direct and indirect victims and survivors. If you had a chance to review this IMS, you may have noticed that the document also refers to another term, namely critically injured in the section that lays out the role of mine action operators. A critically injured person is a person that has not yet been medically stabilized and may still die from their injuries without accessing life-saving emergency medical services. The Victim Assistance Expert Group charged with the responsibility of developing this IMAS felt it was important to also refer to this group of direct victims, given recent trends to increasingly refer to survivors and less to victims. This shift brings with it the risk that the need for access to and the provision of life-saving emergency medical services for people critically injured is forgotten, knowing that this can greatly reduce the mortality rate, i.e. ensure that many people injured actually become survivors. The IMAS makes special mention of this group of people. I go to slide eight on the role of the mine action sector in victim assistance. So you could see this as the terms of reference for the mine action sector and victim assistance. This is section six of the IMAS. Section seven then breaks it down per actor. Now I just want to remind everybody who's here that victim assistance should be implemented in what's called a dual approach, also called the integrated approach. With on the one hand, as should be clear by now, multi-sector engagement by non-mine action actors that reach people that are injured, survivors, and people otherwise impacted by explosive ordnance accidents. On the other hand, 
there should be specific victim assistance efforts undertaken by the mine action sector in four core areas. First one being information management, including data collection, analysis of disaggregated data, and dissemination of aggregated data. The second area of work is referral of victims and other people with similar needs to relevant service providers through the appropriate government body using existing referral mechanisms if available. Thirdly, we should be promoting and monitoring multi-sector engagement and share information on specific issues related to victims with relevant actors in an effort to mobilize a multi-sector response. And the example I gave earlier was, we see that the mortality rate of victims is really high, anywhere over 12 to 14%, then we know we have to act. We have to carry that data to the Ministry of Health and other health actors to mobilize an emergency healthcare response in those geographical areas with high mortality rates. The fourth area of work is supporting the development of relevant national action plans and related coordination mechanisms, including the mobilization of resources required to support victim assistance. That means, for example, sitting at the table when a national action plan on disability is developed or on social protection to make sure that the specific needs of victims, whether direct or indirect, are taken into consideration. It's important to keep in mind that these efforts should be carried out to support governments of affected states to ensure services are available and accessible. This is the ultimate aim of the sector's contribution to victim assistance. As such, the sector's engagement with other domains is necessary to promote the progressive mainstreaming of victim assistance in the health, disability, education, employment, development and poverty reduction sectors. This is required as long as the mine action sector is active in the country or until victim assistance is fully integrated into other sectors, whichever comes first. And with that, I go to the last slide that I will speak to at such great length, which is slide nine, on the roles and responsibilities of mine action operators. Could you move to the next slide, Daniela, please? Thank you. Section 7.2, and that's the one we'll cover first, uh, because we believe that most of you are here, uh, are most interested in that section. Time allowing, we will delve into the role of mine action authorities and centers, survivor organizations and donors. But depending on the debate that this is going to raise, we may not get to that today. So section 7.2 outlines the roles and responsibilities of mine action operators. And whilst other mine action actors in this IMS are addressed by should, Operator's role is defined as shells. Now, I just want to say one last thing before I move on here. Um, I think it's really important to understand that Section 7.2 applies in a context where any one of the five pillars of mine action are implemented or supported. So whether you have victim assistance earmarked funding or not, Section 7.2 has to be carried out and it essentially highlights responsibilities and the minimum standards that are expected. So as such, this IMAS can be seen as a minimum standard of the sector's contribution to victim assistance. If you read the IMAS, and this is my last few words, you may have picked up on the fact that the IMAS refers to victim assistance specific efforts and to victim assistance activities. Specific efforts refers to all efforts outlined in Section 7 while activities refers to provision of services in the sectors that victim assistance is a part of, i.e. health, rehab, education, livelihood, social inclusion. On that note, I'd like to pass the floor now to Lopke, a colleague of mine who works with the Fondation Suisse de Déminage, the Swiss Foundation for Demining, who has a really interesting experience to share that, that predates this IMAS on how FSD through their more regular mine action activities already started to contribute to or have the intent, because all of this came into being just before COVID, uh, to contribute to victim assistance. Lopke, the floor is yours. Thank you very Thank much. You very much Elke. Elke. I hear myself. I hear myself. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if I do anything wrong, and I'm not can sure you if you can hear me as well. Right. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I think now it's better. Um, so first of all, thank you for inviting me to um, add a little bit of my um, of my recent experience, at least, to this meeting. 
And thank you very much for your hard work, uh, all of you, or some of you at least, to put in this important document. Um, my name is Lopke Dijkstra, <clears throat> and I've been working for over 15 years in this sector, uh, victim assistance or um, um, rehabilitation work in the humanitarian sector in a broader um, aspect. So I'm very aware of the importance of this document. Um, in, in several mi uh, missions in several countries, I've um, often faced the challenge of the um, um, of not having this doc document in place. So I'm, I'm very happy with these um, uh, developments. So currently I'm involved with um, uh, FSD, which is the Swiss Foundation for Demining, uh, based in Geneva. And um, as the uh, as the name suggests, is this this um, organization is mm, originally focused on demining. Now, um, the idea existed in the organization to integrate victim assistance, uh, which I thought was a very good idea. And since um, October last year, I started to set up the victim assistance pillar within uh, the Mine Action Program. What I will do, and I will try to keep it short, um, is to share a couple of my experiences in doing this, in integrating the victim assistance in a demining organization. Some very interesting experiences. And I think um, this IMS can surely help to, uh, to do this properly. So um, what I did so far is I started off to write some, some policy within the organization, because obviously there was no victim assistance policy as such. Um, and then I developed a pilot project to be um, to be carried out in in Afghanistan, uh, in the Badakhshan province in northeastern Afghanistan, which is not an easy um, an, an easy project site, but a, a site with a very great need for victim assistance, <clears throat> especially because there's a lot of victims, but also it's very very remote, very difficult to access. Um, so I, I wrote up a pilot project after visiting the area and, and doing the analysis, um, mapping existing services, mapping the um, generally mapping the uh, existence of victims and their needs, which I will come back to uh, later on. Uh, next, I developed the SOP, the Standard Operational Procedures for Victim Assistance. And again, this was a quite a difficult exercise because there was no no guiding document and I, I surely hope that this um, IMS will, will help us in this. Uh, the SOP was, uh, was then accredited by the government and also we um, achieved the, um, uh, well, the commitment of the commu uh, community leaders to carry out this um, pilot project. Next, I uh, started to, um, to train a coordinator from the area who will, um, who will when um, when the situation allows, then train a team of um, four focal victim assistance focal persons who then go into the area and identify the victims, identify their needs, um, and most importantly, will then set up the or I set up the referral system, but they will do the actual referral to existing um, service providers. Then, uh, in order to do the identification, I, um, I put together a, a questionnaire about um, or to identify the victims. And we have a, a, we have a database of some cases existing. Um, why? Because FSD has been doing the, um, uh, carrying out the demining activities for over 10 years in this area. So there is a lot of information. Um, one of the pitfalls is that we might think that this information is um, is complete, which probably it isn't. There are victims, there are cases registered in the IMSMA, but um, I'm pretty sure that this that this information is is not up to date and is not complete. Um, then another challenge is to identify not only the victims, not only the direct and indirect victims, but also identify their needs. And the, the problem in this area, like in many areas, is that the needs are par partially related to being a, a landmine or, or explosive victim, but also there are a lot of general needs, like poverty, there's, there's a lack of um, paid jobs, there's a, um, 
people are just living under very harsh uh, circumstances. And there comes a challenge to, to set the boundaries to the projects, which people um, we can assist and which we simply can't. Now this comes to the, um, um, or to come back to this, uh, um, the form that I developed and should be, be tested once the, the activities can be carried out. Um, this will not only cover, um, well, this, this, uh, this questionnaire tries to distinguish the needs and the, the issues and the problems that people, people are facing, um, whether they are related to being a victim, yes or no. And then again starts the, the difficult part of, of trying to, to focus our assistance on the, the fact that they are victims. Okay. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned the um, existing service providers. I also mentioned that this area is very uh, remote and uh, underserviced. Now there are service providers like ICRC, but as, as Elko also mentioned, they are located in the, um, in the more urbanized areas, while the victims are uh, located in the in the local and in, in the in the remote areas. Now the transportation is one of the of the main. Um, problems that provide people from access these services and also information. People simply often don't know. They don't know which services exist and also they don't know their rights. So what we try to do in this uh, project is to bridge that, that gap basically, is to um, identify, refer where needed and possible, make sure that this um, referral is not only done on paper but is actually carried out. And um, last step is also to evaluate if the services provided were actually useful and did um, improve the quality of life. Now, um, going from the quality of life, I can move on to the observations that I did while um, setting up this, first of all, this pilot project. Because the victim assistance, in my opinion, is, is very much um, aims to, to improve the quality of life of landmine and, and other explosive uh, ordnance victims. Whereas mine clearance is much more um, measured in, in, um, in quantitative uh, data. And this is one of the first differences that I, that I realized between, uh, for example, demining activities and victim assistance activities. So the, the differences in, um, in measurement, dif differences in, uh, in targets, in goals, and also in, in, in a broader perspective. Whereas mine clearance is um, a job that in the end, hopefully it is finished. Whereas victim assistance is an ongoing job. And this is one of the, um, of the very obvious but also obvious topics but also I realized that there's um, that um, this is often overlooked is that the victim assistance is a, is a long-term process um, the collaboration with other actors the sustainability the accountability and the governance are topics that are very different in for example mine clearance Another difference that I um, and, and a challenge that I came across is the is a, is the language. We are talking about different things. We are talking about different needs. We are talking about different persons, and um, also the people who carry out this work come from different backgrounds. Demining, in my experience, is often done by people with a military background, um, whereas. Victim assistance has strong relationships to the health and social sectors, but also education, um, work. There, there is so much related to it that is not necessarily related to other uh, mine action pillars. And I think this is a, a big challenge ahead of us. Um, another point that I never realized so much until the last couple of months is that there's also a different uh, perspective when you look at donors. Donors that are funding uh, demining activities are not 
um, necessarily interested in funding victim assistance. And again, the long-term commitment is a very requires a very different donor than the the relatively short commitment of of land clearance. Um, another thing that that I that honestly surprised me a little bit is that um, um, there's still some sort of idea that once a person has received services, the job is done. And what surprised me is that this is still also the approach of service providers within the victim assistance sector. For example, I, uh, well, I was setting up the referral system with the ICRC clinic in, in one of the, or in the, in the nearest um, town close to this project site, is that this, um, uh, it was said, well, in your, in your project area, we, uh, people are being serviced, they, they received um, assistance, which is true in many cases, but it was done over 20 or 30 years ago, because in this specific area, there are victims dating back to the Soviet period. Um, so people are mostly old cases, so to say. And I was a bit struck by the fact that even ICRC somehow has the perception, once somebody received a prosthetic limb, then the job is done, which I think is a very um, obvious mistake. And um, this is one thing that I, I also hope to find some, some guidance in the IMS uh, where the ongoing nature of this, yeah, of this work is, is highlighted. Um, so these are a couple of, sorry, can go just, ahead. Can I just ask you to, to, to wrap up? And yeah. the next speaker will be uh, Gary Toombs, who is the EOD Global Specialist of HI based in London. And I'm going to ask also Daniela to put on the screen uh, the page 12 of the IMS on the VA, the chapter on the, on the 7.2 on the mine action operators. But if you have a, a last poll locker, please go ahead. And meanwhile, I will add uh, ask the 70 participants to to start putting questions and feedback in the in a chat box thank you Rutger, um, a... you sorry you interrupted me at the at the right moment because i was about to um to finish up and um say thank you and let's see uh let's move on with the the next speaker and thank you for this opportunity to um add a little bit of my um experiences no thank you very much it's uh, very encouraging that uh, F, uh, SD is already trying to implement the IMS on the VA uh, and has uh, hired you to, to help them with that. So we're very pleased about that. Um, now, uh, the floor is you, Gary. OK, thank you, Lubka, and thank you for the introduction, Christelle. Um, as a mine action sector, it is really important to appreciate that the six elements comprising of victim assistance are and effectively should be part of broader sectors and broader efforts. We also accept and understand that the vast majority of victim assistance, including emergency and ongoing medical care, rehabilitation, psychological and social support, facilitation of, and access to education and, and economic inclusion is managed outside of the mine action sector, although the sector does have an important role to play. IMAS 1310 has been produced to define how the mine action sector can do this, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the VA Working Group and the IMAS Review Board for getting it across the line and approved so promptly. Um, it certainly has been challenging and simply finding a common language, as Lobka alluded to, between the mine action sector and the broader sectors has been difficult. Um, let's take the term victim assistance, for example. Now, outside of the mine action sector, the term victim assistance is not used in the way that we in the sector understand it. Whilst many non-mine action actors are engaged in treating and supporting victims of EO, they do not call it victim assistance and tend to associate this term with the assistance for victims of uh, gender based violence or victims of other humanitarian rights violations. Um, so, again, that's um, quite important to understand. Um, 
some of these agencies or uh, organisations that are providing health services or those that facilitate access to schools and work opportunities for explosive ordnance survivors and other persons with disabilities. So it is quite a big sector. Um, IMS 1310, like when does it apply to us as a mine action operator? Well, in the context where mine action actors, uh, whether you're an authority, a centre, an operator, a survivor organisation or a donor that are implementing or supporting any of the five pillars of mine action, and highlights the responsibility, uh, the document 1310 highlights the responsibilities and the minimum standards are expected. OK, as um, Christelle mentioned, I'm going to talk specifically about 7.2, the responsibilities of mine action operators. Um, and as you can see on the slide, um, it's been clearly stated out. I'll read through it, the first one just to give uh, an idea, but it states that mine action operators or their implementing partners undertaking victim assistance on their behalf shall and that's very important you shall inform the national mine action center and the affected communities of all your va activities and available support so you need even if you're not doing anything you just let need to inform the national authority okay th this is what we're doing and this will come into section d e f and g um, we need to ensure that any victim assistance activities you undertake comply with relevant national and or international standards and relevant health, education or socioeconomic policies. Um, the third sort of task is to ensure that partner VA organisations are registered with the relevant ministry. Now that could be the health, the Ministry of Health, um, and if there's no um, national authority or a governing body, there may be other actors locally that are working. Um, so again, you need to make sure that they are competent, suitably trained and qualified. You need to collect age, sex and disability de desegregated data on people killed, critically injured and survivors in line with relevant data protection regulations and ensure relevant data is shared with the appropriate national entity. Whilst obviously ensuring that data ethics and protection principles are abided to. Now that's really important in some contexts. Okay, so you need to be aware of that and factor that in. Um, support the dissemination of any directory of services to survivors, indirect victims and others with non-life-threatening needs for whom a lack of information is the main barrier for accessing available services. Um, identifying and facilitating access to, or if unavailable, provide emergency medical transport of people critically injured by EO and any other person with life-threatening injuries to a nearby healthcare facility in an area where you are operating in. Finally, you need to communicate the needs of the people that's being critically injured, survivors and indirect victims on the basis of available data to donors and actors in the sectors of which victim assistance is part in order to engage in a broader multi-sector support. Now, these seven responsibilities outlined are a minimum standard and are to be implemented even when there is no VA earmarked funding within the mine action budget. So as an operator, we need to factor these additional tasks or responsibilities in when we are conducting our mine action programming. Now, that was very brief and very quick, but that concludes my very short presentation. Um, do you want me to pass over to Sophie Nowell or do you want to open up for questions? Um, perhaps I can answer one of the questions that in the chat box and then we go to Sophie. If Sophie, are you there? Are you ready to take over after a short intervention by me? Sophie, are you, are you on the call with us? Yes, yeah, I'm here. From Erbil. OK, thanks. So wonderful, Gary. Thanks for this introduction. It's It's been fascinating for Gary and I as we have started to um, put our head around what a standard operating procedure for victim assistance could look like. That it is quite complicated, perhaps even more complicated for an organization like HI, which is multi mandated. You know, we do our our clearance survey, EOR activities, but then we also um, are 
so-called victim assistance operator word that I don't like to use, but we provide, you know, services in prosthetics, orthotics, MHPSS, inclusive education, etc. So even for us having, you know, chaired the victim assistance expert group under the IMS review board, um, it has been really interesting to see how when we actually start to try to put down in practical terms what the implications are for our teams working on the ground on survey or land release or risk education, what this means, that it raises a lot of questions. So as I said earlier, we don't have all the answers, but I'm going to try to answer one of the questions that was asked by Henry Bonin. Thanks, Henry, for your question. I'll just read it out. Henry asked if it could be considered that in some context where needs are not covered by health sector compared to the extent of the needs, i.e. there's greater needs than the health sector can meet. Could the HMA sector and funds directly support health services as a part of VA role? Uh, and is this described in the IMAS? So clearly the IMAS is not going to give you any guidance on how you should deliver mental health and psychosocial support or deliver prosthetic legs. But the answer to your question is yes. Um, we can, of course, ask for victim assistance activities to be funded as part of a broader mine action envelope. Humanity and inclusion regularly applies for funding for rehab, prosthetics, orthotics, mental health, psychosocial support as part of this broader mine action envelope. HI is a multi mandated organization, as I just said, so it's easy to do for us. But for other mine action operators who don't have that skill set necessarily under their roof, it is an option to engage an implementing partner to undertake these activities. Um, the IMAS in that sense uh, gives you a couple of uh, guidances, particularly A to C in section 7.2, um, which would oblige you to make sure that the partner that you're engaging, for example, to do MHP assess, it might be a survivor organization that's going to apply, you know, provide peer to peer support, actually is registered with the relevant authority. So your task is to make sure that this is the case so that you can be ensured that your implementing partner is delivering quality services. I hope that answers your question. Sophie. Sophie is a dear colleague, works with humanity and inclusion in Iraq, uh, previously in South Sudan, elsewhere now in Iraq for a number of years. Um, I asked her to speak briefly just about an experience of the HI program there to demonstrate how HI already as part of, and Sophie will speak to our explosive ordinance risk education activities if I got it right, have been complying with this IMA, so have been contributing to victim assistance through explosive ordinance risk education activities. Sophie, can you turn on your camera and the floor is yours. Hi there. Hi. Okay, hopefully you can hear me clearly. Yes. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit on uh, the practical terms. So aside from our victim assistance programming, how we integrate some of these activities into our risk education programming. So some of the things that we've undertaken over the last couple of years has been to train all of our risk education staff in inclusion and disability awareness so that we're speaking the same language so that they are able to identify needs from the populations that they're working with. Um, and to understand the terminology and also to promote a more inclusive um, activity within the community. This also applies to our community liaison staff within the clearance teams. We've also trained them not only to identify people who might need services, but also to collect data on victims and accidents. We then can use this data to influence our risk education programming with regards to whom we should target. Um, similarly, for our clearance programming, but then also um, with regards to identifying the services that are needed for these populations. So we can collect and use the data through risk education teams. Um, we've also trained all of our risk education staff to deliver psychological first aid, which is the first, uh, it's the sort of recognised MHPSS approach for people who are having first contact with families. So recognising that they may be asking families about um, victims, um, so people who are injured or killed within their family, to be able to provide that immediate support to a family so they feel equipped with the skills to do that, before then advising the family about their rights, the services that are available, making referrals to those services and collecting the data. So in a nutshell, 
Um, that's how we've kind of actively integrated it into our risk education programming. We then obviously link this with our more diverse programming on victim assistance and have created referral pathways between the different project teams. That's it. Thank you very much. I see there is a question coming from Keiko uh, in the chat box. Keiko, do you want just to, uh, to ask your questions, please? And maybe if you could say a little bit uh, about your organization, which does a lot on victim assistance. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Keiko, working for a CDA response on my action, and especially focusing on uh, victim assistance. And uh, I really share a lot of the point of view with Rubke. Uh, when we started, we really start doing everything in the darkness. There are no SOP written, there are no guidance on SOP. So it, because we are more heavily involved in the health sector, so we use our standard health indication, etc. But at the same time, for for much component of the victim assistance is not only the health inclusion, social awareness, and also <clears throat> against the social discrimination, etc. So we really needed a March sectoral approach and then comprehensive package. We built on over the years. Each year we added one component, one component, tried to help the multiple package, but it was a struggle for us to reach that point. So like my question was, it would be useful to have some kind of the example package, maybe depending on your context, your organization capacity, you may not be able to adjust or adapt everything, but something example, some example you can add it on to your ongoing activity. From our experience, some of the activity doesn't cost you much of the expertise, doesn't cost you much of the money. It just on a bit of the planning from the beginning, and then it can create a huge impact and then difference to the individual life. So that's what I'm hoping. But Crystal is already answered. Now you have a plan to develop the SOP, which probably give us a bit more hands-on process for each organization to plan. But I very much appreciate, as a, someone working in a field long time, to have us. You don't, it's not compulsory, but something good set of the example you can apply depending on your context. Thank you so much. Elke, would you like to add anything on the SOPs? Yeah, thank you, Kaiko. Thanks, Christelle. So it is now up to each operator, any organization, whether commercial or not for profit who is touching mine action funds will need to develop their own standard operating procedures. This will be something specifically developed by and for the organization, so adapted to their specific realities. National authorities um, in affected states will need to develop now a national mine action standard on victim assistance, again adapted to their specific context, but in line with the international mine action standard on the topic that we're presenting today. What I'm curious to hear um, from my colleagues working in other mine action organizations, so I don't know if colleagues are here from MAG or HALO and PA, DDG, DCA, if you have any experience already with undertaking any of, the, any of those uh, activities described in 7.2, or if you have any questions about them. Of course, most of those organizations were part of the Expert Victim Assistance Working Group, um, but questions or comments or actual direct experiences like shared by Sophie and Lopke would be really helpful for us to hear. Is there anybody who would like to take the floor on either experiences or questions related to section 7.2? Clear as water, is that what this means? Well, yeah, from my side, I can just say that I um, I think I'm not the, the one to um, to take the lead on this because I'm not so much aware of the of the actual content. That's why uh, on my side, it was silence, but maybe some other people have different reasons to be silent. 
<laughs> That's a very good point. I see that uh, we have William Chemali, the coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster, who wants to take the floor. So um, great, but uh, indeed we would like also to hear from some of the mine action coordinators and the mine action operators who have joined us. You know, don't be shy. We know it's complicated, it's challenging. Uh, share with us uh, and ask questions. William, you have the floor. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I would like to confirm if uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Great. Well, uh, with much less authority uh, on the topic than the coordinators from the field, I wanted to first thank you for the excellent set of uh, presentations, uh, the excellent initiative of bringing us together on this important topic. Um, I really like the, the simplicity of the message. I think it's a, a it's an issue that has to be on the on the general radar of a, uh, of all donors and and partners. Uh, many of you have mentioned that this is a responsibility that that touches on many other sectors uh, and so on. Uh, so I I really welcome uh, this uh, this conversation. My comment and question is. Um, what we're seeing in the, during the pandemic now, uh, or series of pandemics from Ebola to COVID-19, and the overall uh, violent extremism environment is that access uh, to, to certain parts of territories is really slowing down uh, in many parts of the world. And for victims assistance, um, I assume that much of the follow-up is naturally converging, as you mentioned, to to assistance from within the community through uh, through people living in the communities and grassroots organizations to do this follow up. It would be great to hear examples of how this uh, this uh, kind of local uh, response societies are being interacted with. Uh, are there plans to responsabilize them more? Uh, in an in a, in a operational sense, uh, is there uh, any uh, step up game to really benefit from uh, from this active energy that could do a lot uh, if well uh, supported and, uh, and empowered? Uh, I would stop here and get back to you, uh, Christelle and Andrew. Elke, would you like to answer that? Yes, I will. Uh, I'll do my best. Thank you, William. Good to see you briefly. Just to um, clarify that this international mine action standard only applies for non-governmental organizations or not-for-profit and for commercial operators. So it, it really targets a very, uh, you know, specific set of actors. That said, um, you touched on something which is related to access, particularly in areas with recent or even still ongoing conflict. Um, access is often a huge issue. And we find that in many, many cases, the only people that are going into those areas that are not from those areas are the survey teams. Are the community liaison people? Are the risk education workers for for HI? Our activities on victim assistance specifically and on on explosive risk or uh, education, uh, explosive ordnance risk education are often trust building opportunities to go into communities where access is really really limited, and access is limited, um, particularly because of the explosive um, threat. Then. The mine action operators that are going indoor are often the only ones that are in touch with people in those areas. Hence, all the more important for them to reach out, uh, not only to understand, you know, how many items have contaminated X amount of square meters, but also to be the bridge that connects people in need. And that's why non-discrimination is so important. So survivors, other people in need to the services that exist. And here I ask all of you to really think about services, not only formal services, but also informal services. Now, what through victim assistance has been happening, which could be interesting to you, is that 
We have a lot of experience in HI to work directly with survivor organizations who are excellent providers of so-called peer-to-peer support. So it's an informal way of providing mental health outreach um, by one survivor who is further along on, on the coping, uh, recovering recovery process to another, which, you know, from experiences from colleagues, I don't know if, if Faraz is here, for example, from the Implementation Support Unit of the Maimon Treaty, has literally saved the life of people who are ready to end their life. So mental health services often scarce in the context in which we work. No other service providers going in other than mine action operators have a responsibility to reach out to these organizations, see if they can support them to provide those necessary services. So it's very much in line with the localization agenda um, and with local capacity building. I mean, that's a very broad answer, uh, William. Um, but yeah, in that sense, just to, to cap this off as saying this IMAS really is for the mine action sector. There will be things that I think are relevant to take into other uh, sectors, but it's not designed as such. And getting at this already was quite a challenge because we're asking a lot there where nothing was asked before. Thanks, William. Thank you, Elke. I see that there is a question from Abigail. Abigail, I'm going to give you the floor in one minute. I also uh, would like to invite people to read the comment from Henry on, on victim assistance in Syria. Abigail, you have the floor. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say at the end, it's not a question, Elke, but just to say thank you so much. I can see that there are some people from Afghanistan on, in, the, in the meeting. And it just cast my mind back to something like 2010 when we started developing a, a dashboard for measuring um, the quality of, uh, of implementers using UN funds. And we had no reference in which to decide whether people were doing VA well or badly or, or any kind of uh, reference. So. It's just really, really great that you and your team and everybody, many people on this call spent so much time looking into this that really will have a big and really positive impact. And thank you for doing that, Elka. Oh. Big work. Thank you for leading on it. Thanks, Abby. And uh, Yunel, would you like to ask questions or contribute? I can see that uh, we'll now see you on the video. Yonel, uh, program manager in Nigeria for ONMAS. And so coordinator of the uh, My Action Subsector. No, I, I, I mean, this is really welcome. The only thing that we were capable to uh, identify so far with the uh, partners uh, operating here in the uh, Nigeria is that there is a gap victim assistance. We have a gap. And, and you know, there is a gap. We just don't know how to to address uh, for different reasons. Uh, one is our uh, lack of uh, knowledge, expertise in the field, but I'm sure that the, the, the VA, uh, the IMAS can, uh, can help, but also because of the very stage, uh, uh, very moment we are with my election. Uh, it, for the time being, Nigerian uh, authorities are still not uh, uh, elaborated uh, a strategy to get back on track with the APMBC. Uh, the military are in the lead uh, in the region that is more affected by uh, explosive uh, ordinances. And uh, just a, a point on, on the, what you say uh, concerning access here, uh, and I, I see exactly what, uh, what you say. But here, uh, the problem of access is not because of explosive. The problem of access is because of people who will kill you directly. Uh, so we cannot even access in the areas to do some uh, some mine action, some clearance, uh, etc. Um, so I don't have any other thoughts uh, except the fact that I have a feeling that we start from scratch. So now. What uh, I will have to, to, to work on with uh, partners, with national authorities, is how uh, that uh, IMAS, uh, how all of this can be uh, incorporated into uh, different levels of approach. One being very, uh, let's say, strategic or at the federal level, and one being very, uh, very uh, local. 
but uh, but also how to engage the donors, etc. So in a sense, uh, we we need to develop a full strategy. Over. Thank you very much, Lionel. It just reminds me that uh, IMAS on VA is actually an excellent advocacy tool uh, for dialogue with national authorities. And perhaps, Elke, uh, uh, we can go to the rest of the presentation. I think that you had a slide to describe the role of the national authorities. Maybe we can uh, bridge and go, go to that slide if, if you think it's useful. And I think you have probably an answer for, uh, for, uh, for uh, Lionel. Please go ahead. Well, as, as Leila was speaking and as I was still reflecting on William's question, I thought that it might be useful for you, Sophie, if you're still with us, to speak about the experience of the community safety committees that you have been developing in Iraq. Would you mind, because I think that's a really good example and, an, and a possible channel to in a very small way, start to address some of the conflict dynamics to build the trust and ultimately to gain access to people that are that are in need. Are you still with us, Sophie? Yep, yep, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, would you please just maybe briefly highlight what we're doing? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so in Iraq, we, as part of our risk education programming, we've started to establish community safety committees. And these are committees of local leaders, um, but we also try and ensure that they're gender balanced, so they have women representatives on them, also that we have some youth um, and also persons with disabilities or survivors. Um, and these committees are then formed. We provide them with basic risk education measures, um, messages. We provide them with the resources to deliver that, and we link them with our community focal points. And they're linked between our clearance teams and also our risk education. And then we also talk to them about what their community needs. So we help them start to put together a plan about what their community needs with regards to safe spaces. Um, in two communities, we've built a playground that they're linked to and will take over the responsibility of managing. Um, and also developing messages that they want to share within their communities, people that they think they want to target within their communities. And this might be with regards to safety, so risk education, but also identifying the needs that their communities have. So giving them the, the information and the resources to be able to direct people to services. Um, and the idea is, as we start to develop this more, that we'll start to do um, some advocacy training with them on how to develop messages and how to start to lobby the different government groups and different bodies that are actually choosing which locations are cleared um, and helping to prioritise. So as we take this activity, so it's quite new in Iraq, we started to establish them around six months ago. Um, and, and as we started to look at that, we then started to look at the conflict dynamics um, and whether they want to play a role within their community on this as well. So we'll take that forward. And that's it. Thanks. Alka, you want to say a few words on the role of uh, uh, national mine action authorities, perhaps? I could see yes. that Daniela put the slide on on the screen. Yes, thank you so much. So the IMAS highlights the roles and responsibilities of five different actors. We've only looked at one so far, namely those of operators. Um, the actual first two up, the first two actors that are addressed in the IMAS is the National Mine Action Authority and separately the National Mine Action Center. Uh, the other two actors are donors and survivor organizations. Um, initially, within the VA Expert Working Group, we talked about a sixth actor, which is the ministries that often are being delegated with the responsibility to coordinate victim assistance. So think about, um, you know, in Cambodia, it's shared by the uh, Cambodian Mine Action Authority and the, I think it's um, the Ministry of Social Welfare, Women and Labor. Apologies if I don't say the name correctly. In, in some countries it is entirely, sorry, there's a truck passing by, entirely being carried by the Ministry for Social Welfare. Uh, or MOLSA MD uh, in the past, as it was the case in Afghanistan. So we thought about creating a, a section on the sixth actor ministries. In the end, it was decided that no, uh, it would be confusing because these minist ministries have a mandate that goes beyond victim assistance. Uh, it would be too broad. And instead, it was decided that 
the section that covers national mine action authorities, which you see up on the slide, um, would also address the responsibilities of a ministry who has been delegated with the responsibility to victim assistance, to coordinate victim assistance, sort of in addition to their normal terms of reference. So these would be additional tasks that the ministry would have to carry out. So what you can see here on these six bullet points are um, basically a, a slight elaboration of what we saw earlier, which is covered in section six of the IMAS, um, related to making sure that the data that's collected on casualties is centralized somewhere and carried out into other broader national data collection efforts so that we don't see what happened in Uganda happen in countries that are still having active mine action centers, but make sure that this casualty data actually gets carried into data collection mechanisms that will exist after the closure of the center. They also have the, the task to collect data on existing services if no other ministry is doing that in those area where mine action operator operations are taking place. So clearly a national mine action authority is not going to be charged to map services in all of the country, but in those areas where the sector is working, data needs to be collected through NTS, non-technical survey, not only for the purpose of understanding confirmed and suspect hazard areas, but also to understand what is the formal and informal system of services here, so that we know um, what services are there, create a director of services that then should be carried in the pocket of every risk education worker, community liaison staff, clearance worker, so that if they come across somebody with a need, they can at least eliminate the first barrier to accessing services, which is a lack of knowledge. Of course, often much more is needed, but this is where it's the role of the National Mine Action Authority to also make sure that they are communicating to the ministries that are providing the services about the needs that present so that they can do the outreach. That's why it's also the role of the National Mine Action Operators or the Mine Action Operators, just as explained by Gary, to reach out at a local level to service providers to make sure they can come in uh, and provide the necessary services on the basis of the needs that we are presenting to them. Clearly, the National Mine Action Authority should as such be promoting multi-sector engagement. It's to go to the Ministry of Health to say you need emergency medical response here, to deal with the ministry that's responsible for availability of prosthetic and orthotic materials and say, look, you know, we have X amount of new casualties here this year. We know on the base of their injury that X amount likely will need a new prosthetic leg, um, knowing that children need two to three new legs every year. Say something about the data to the actors that actually can provide the services. The National Mine Action Authority should also promote participation of victims in, for example, the whole priority setting process, or in, as you can see, explosive ordinance risk education, promoting inclusive hiring practices so that risk education efforts are being carried out in part by survivors and other persons with disabilities and ensure that these risk education sessions also integrate some very light disability inclusion messages to end, hopefully, or at least start informing the local population about the discriminating attitudes that, that exist, the superstitions that, that lead to people with disabilities, including survivors being excluded from mainstream life. The section is quite elaborate in, in the IMAS. I, I think I will stop there. Um, Hi, Gary. Yeah, Gary, go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, obviously the main focus of the sector's VA response is going to be directed towards strengthening and uh, the sustainability of the national effort to provide support to existing victims. And as the more land is released under the Mine Action Programme, we should see a noticeable reduction in the number of VO victims. But it's the responsibility of the National Mine Action Authority to collect that data that's being given to them by the mine action operators and then allow them to or to inform them how best to prioritize the tasking order on where the mine action operators are going to be needed the most do you know what i mean yes yeah absolutely yep so yeah. coordinating and targeting risk education non-technical survey technical survey and clearance on the needs based on the data that's being provided by the mine action operators is really important in the prior prioritization process 
because obviously that will then hopefully we'll see a, a clear reduction in the number of victims that are being um, brought to the attention of, of our staff of the mine action operators and the, and the Man, National Mine Action Authority. Thanks, Gary. I, I see that my director, Emmanuel Sauvage, noticed that most of the time uh, National Mine Action Authorities are composed of interministerial are composed of a number of interministerial bodies, so that it should be easy to share information. Um, the operative word is should. In my experience, only very few countries actually communicate data for the purpose of victim assistance. I would say the Cambodian Mine Action Authority is one of those, but in many instances, somehow uh, a National Mine Action Authority doesn't seem to charge itself with any responsibility on victim assistance. Yes, casualty data is collected, but it's to inform risk education, targeting or priority setting. But it's not viewed through the lens of what can we do with this to facilitate access to services? How can we carry this information out of our little mine action uh, database and share it with the actors that are ultimately responsible for delivering the services? Christelle, I see Abby has her hand up, but I don't know if it's there from before or if there's a new question. Unfortunately, we have only two minutes left, so we have to close. Elke, uh, would you be okay if we shared your PowerPoint presentation with everybody? Sure, yeah, I can share my notes as well. It's, uh, yeah. Yes, excellent. So, so we'll share that with, uh, with uh, all the uh, Mine Action AOR colleagues. And in addition, we will uh, share the, the recording of, of the webinar. I would like just to stress that a number of colleagues work in countries where the governments are not necessarily very interested in implementing victim assistance or where there's some uh, major difficulty in, uh, you know, agreeing on, on what the mine action sector should do in this country. And so that adds a lot of of complexity to, to what we are trying to do uh, because we'd like them to coordinate among themselves. But in the end, we, we also need to coordinate with other uh, humanitarian actors to provide this multi-sectoral assistance, you know, pending a situation where maybe the government will, will take full leadership on that. So I think we need to be also aware of that. I'll close by saying two things. One, I really hope that we've uh, uh, given you uh, interest and uh, the desire to read this IMAS on victim assistance and to comply with it. And, and secondly, I wanted to say that as part of the humanitarian needs overview, humanitarian response plan cycle, the, which is going to start very soon, I hope that the Mine Action AOR coordinator will convene a discussion with the operators to see what is the best way uh, to take this forward. And since we all know that funding is a problem, I hope that there will be pr proposal in those humanitarian response plan to address the gap. And, uh, and once we have that, we can go, for instance, and do advocacy with the Central Emergency Response Fund or other funds to really uh, make sure that we uh, we plug this gap. So uh, maybe I'll give you uh, the floor again, Elke, if you want to say any last thing before we close. I'm hard pressed to close because I see two people have their hands up, um, but um, we can continue to discuss. Yeah, I mean, if right uh, Zarin, we, you want to take the question from Zarin? Okay, Zar Zarin, go uh, ahead. Thank you very much. Uh and uh, all colleagues uh, and uh, congratulations this uh, very unique and good work uh, which you accomplish uh, it is highly appreciated uh, just to let the colleagues and everyone it is a uh, a very good uh, job which is done but it is not difficult to apply somehow uh, from afghanistan in our context uh, in mine action authority uh, we have uh, developed ms upon national mine action standard in 2012 uh, with the same context, a little bit similar, uh, and it was also applied uh, at the national level uh, about the SOP. All the 
uh, implementing partner to the VA. Uh, so they also cope and develop the SOP. It is not a, a difficult job. Uh, and looking to the uh, synergies, it is also a very good uh, uh, advocacy tool uh, because uh, when we had a MS, it was internally uh, at national level. Uh, it was a little bit uh, challenging for the advocacy, for the resource mobilization. But now, uh, with the global support, uh, widely and globally, because it has very synergies with uh, many other legal uh, documents, conventions, which is ratified by many uh, states. So it is a good tool to uh, help us a lot for resource mobilization. And also the colleagues uh, might be agree with me, there is very limited fund allocated resources allocated to the victim assistance. So how the Mine Action Authority itself and the Mine Action Operator donors and those who are uh, making advocacy for resource mobilization uh, to improve this uh, uh, fundraising for the victim assistant as well. Uh, about the seven point, it is very relevant and it is very applicable uh, in our context. Uh, all the colleagues they are using to develop the SOP, uh, they are created uh, by the Mine Action Authority, HI, it is one of the organizations which is created in VA uh, with the Mine Action Authority. So it is not a difficult job for the colleagues. I think it is quite capable and now we have very strong documents to advocate and to do fundraising. Thank you very much. Over. Elke, would you like to react or can I close? Just one one message that I'd like to pass. If anybody, uh, you know, that joined this session, uh, what I would hope for you to walk away with is to appreciate now that it is possible and now necessary to contribute to victim assistance, even if you're not getting any funding for victim assistance, but you're doing your regular, call them traditional mine action activities. You can actually make a contribution to improve the quality of life by, you know, referral and improving access to services and getting the data to the actors that can actually do something. So we have a role to play as the mine action sector. It is not the entirety of victim assistance, but we play a really important bridging function. So I just hope that colleagues, friends will walk away seeing this as a minimum standard. This is the least I have to do if I work in a mine action or in an explosive ordinance affected area, even if my program is doing nothing uh, that's funded uh, by mine action funding for victim assistance just as part of our risk education, our community liaison, we need to add a couple of tasks to the terms of reference of the different staff working in the field so that they play their role in facilitating access to services. My last words, thank you, Christelle, for, for facilitating, Bruno, for chairing. Um, over to you. Bruno, you can give the closing remark if you'd like. If not, I say bye to everybody. Please. Oh, you're muted, Bruno. Unmute, please. Yeah, no, no need to. Uh, this was extremely useful and fruitful, and I and I love the discussions. And and I think you know I have a the preferential option for for colleagues who who tell us their experience from what you guys call field, I call in country. So thank you so much, LK, and all the colleagues and uh, bravo for this uh, webinar. Bye now. Yeah, thank you, Chai, for leading uh, the development of this IMS. Thank you a lot to the whole HI team. And we'll continue <laughs> to collaborate with you. Thanks so much, Christine. Bye, everyone. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. Bye-bye. And thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.